Hello and welcome to this online broadcast from Whitechapel Gallery. My name's Jane Scarth and I'm the Curator of Public Programmes. Thank you for joining us for today's talk. Today's event is part of our Big Ideas series, which offers a platform for um, uh, it offers a platform for renowned artists, scholars, writers, architects, and curators to share and discuss their work and research. And we're very grateful to the Stanley Picker Trust who continue to so generously support this series. It's my great pleasure to welcome Astrida Namanis, who joins us this evening to deliver a talk as part of a season of events on themes of water and fluidity, which is part of our newly launched program called Ways of Knowing, Imagining Other Futures. Ways of Knowing is a programme of art and ideas, bringing us into dialogue with alternative ways of thinking about our relationship to the world through an emerging and interconnected programme of live events and digital projects which centre otherwise peripheral knowledges, ways of knowing questions what we can know and how we can come to know it. The programme offers a spectrum of approaches to key themes that are essential to contemporary society, culture and politics. This season our focus is on water and fluidity and it's inspired by our upcoming major retrospective of work by British surrealist artist Eileen Agar, which opens on the 19th of May. Agar was fascinated by water worlds, marine life, shells, the coastal and the amphibious. So this series of, event, of events invites artists and thinkers who investigate contemporary fluidities and new imaginations of water at a moment when our human relationship to it is arguably at its most strained. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Astrida Namanis, who is a writer and cultural theorist working at the intersection of feminism and environmental change. Her research focuses on bodies of water and weather and how they can help us reimagine justice, care, responsibility and relation in the time of climate catastrophe. Her most recent book, Bodies of Water, Post-Human Feminist Phenomenology, is a call for humans to examine our relationship to oceans, watersheds and other aquatic life forms from the perspective of our own primarily watery bodies and our ecological, poetic and political connections to other bodies of water. Her work has been featured at the Shanghai Biennale, Riga Biennale and the Lofoten Biennale as, and as part of many other artistic, academic and community events and publications. Astrida recently joined the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, on unceded Silk and Okanagan lands in Kelowna, Canada. Thank you so much, Astrida, for accepting our invitation to speak as part of this series. We're delighted that you're joining us today to share your ideas and contribute to the programme, which is very much inspired by your work and thinking. Um, before we begin, I'd like to mention that throughout the pandemic, we've moved our live events programme online, and it's been wonderful to continue to share a vibrant programme of arts and ideas digitally. While we offer these online events free of charge, we do rely on the generosity of your donations to secure our future. So please consider making a donation by following a link which will be posted in the chat shortly. I'll now hand over to Astrida, who will present the talk for around 30 minutes, uh, which is followed by a Q&A that I'll host and include questions from the audience. So please share those on the live chat function available on YouTube. Uh, now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming Astrida. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am uh, broadcasting to you today from the unceded uh, silk lands of the Okanagan and Silk people here in British Columbia. I wish you could see the beautiful mountains and lake outside my window, um, rather than this awful background behind me. Um, but I do want to acknowledge and express my gratitude to the Silk people for maintaining this beautiful space um, since time immemorial um, as a place where I now live and work. And thank you also to Jane and to Whitechapel Gallery and the Big Ideas Program for this uh, incredible invitation. Um, when, uh, when I was invited to give this talk, I admit that I didn't know that much about Eileen Agar's work. Um, I accepted anyways. Uh, I assumed there was a reason that Jane had found some resonance between the show, this public program, and my writing. Um, and of course, this was borne out. I learned of Agar's beachcombing, her preoccupations with marine life. I read that Agar was sometimes known as the surrealist of the sea. 
But as I began to dig deeper, uh, I admit to a small panic. How could anything that I might conjure resonate with the life of a daughter of an heiress, an acquaintance once removed from painters like Renoir and Bonnard and Monet, a woman of the salons of London and Paris, whose studio furniture is now housed in the b &A. I felt very much out of my element, my own watery element that is mostly steeped in thinking about trauma of climate catastrophe, the question of environmental justice, and uh, an interest in what humble acts of imagination can do to help us look these things in the eye. Still looking for connection, though, I read more about Igar's practice and uh, paid more close attention to her works, uh, discovering how she would gather objects from the shoreline. I thought about what it takes to shore ourselves and our communities up against the world. I thought about what we surround ourselves with to lend support. What do we collect in the wake of catastrophe? or perhaps in anticipation of it, two states that might very well be simultaneous. I wondered how can we be in good relation to those who are here in the wake with us. I thought about Agar's belief that the surreal is formed not in dreams, but in the natural world around us. I wondered about how she was changed by the seaside rocks, those geomorphologies she claimed were witnesses to events folding over long stretches of time. And I pictured her, or perhaps more truthfully, someone who was not quite her, but a collage of her and other hers, surrounded by lifetimes of rack, toes in the sand, looking out to the sea. And I imagined a line from Daisy Lafarge's poem, which was composed specifically for this upcoming show's catalog, where Lafarge writes, quote, the wreckage was becoming a reef, or in its repeated variation later in the poem, the wreckage was becoming relief. And this is the story, a collage of various other stories already set adrift that emerges. So now I'm going to tell you the story. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that at the end of the talk, I will have a couple of slides that include uh, references to the images, which are all Eileen Agars, and um, also uh, acknowledgements about some of the citations that are included in the talk. So that will be at the end. Part one, in the rack zone. Like others, whether physically or figuratively, she was on the edge. In this case, she was at the edge of the sea, toes buried in sand. In front of her, the feral logs were turning, lolling in the ecotone between ocean and solid ground. She could tell from their scarred and bolted surfaces that these logs were once things that had held other things. They were once held together and they had held other things together. Now they were spinning out their futile rhythms on this speech of stinking seaweed and plastic, polished pebbles and pitted clams, a dried seahorse on its back amongst flourishes of coral, shells and feathers, wrapped in fishing net. All this wreckage, lying among the footprints of those who had come before her and among those others with whom she was caught in the rack. While alive now in another way, bumping up against the shoreline, these logs were mostly at sea, untethered from what they had once known, from the structures and forms that they shaped and had shaped them. Now these logs needed to figure out a new way to be. The rack zone or the shoreline is a place of collection and a zone of transmogrific transmogrification. It is a place where things are carried from somewhere and carried to somewhere else, where many bodies jostle to eke out a living or where others just give up. It is where the resilience of some is truly astounding. The rack zone is a place of refuge, but also a place that does not house us all equally. 
Any way you cut it, living in the rack zone is rarely easy. Some bodies are spinning like those feral logs, but like this woman, others are stuck. The sea called to her while the solid ground beneath her feet was eroding. After all, she was living in the longest year. The Arctic ice had refused to freeze while the Amazon burned more intensely than ever. Brazil's rainforest rec recorded 61% rise in hotspots from the previous year. Meanwhile, billionaire corporations were getting richer than ever, once profiting from the wet and then from the dry, and then from the chicken tikka masala home gym teacher child algebra in six easy steps, now all delivered by seemingly magical beings leaving packages that collect at your door. Clear cut, fake news, plastic straw, antiviral, anti-vax, bushfire, pipeline, Me Too, travel ban, locker up, essential worker, sucker punch, weather pattern, tax break, homeschool, missing, murdered, order bubble, dude bro, sacred site, mail order, free speech, incel, oil spill, Zoom room, gonzo porn, phone bank, PPE, ACAB, Black lives can't breathe. So very tired. Even if she had weathered this longest year better than many others, her arms were nonetheless aching and in the rack zone of the Holocene, like so many of us, she just really wanted to sleep. What was to be done? Rescue remedy nighttime formula, valerian tea, no caffeine or backbends after 4 p.m. Put the lights on a dimmer and an orange filter on your screen. She took melatonin back in the before times when she used to travel, but soon she was taking it every night. You'll fuck your liver up, someone told her, but the promise of sleep was too seductive. The waves that just barely reached her feet had fingers like a siren song. Her soles moved almost imperceptibly closer to the water. You may think this story is about suicidal ideation. It isn't, or at least it isn't about hers or any personal plans she might harbor. She was simply looking for a way to rest, balanced, just so, by the cradling arms of the undersea current. Here she would be held in the cool and the dark, heartbeat slowed, blood pulling in from her extremities and moving into the expectant shadows created by her compressed lungs. Here she could be suspended in a place of aspiration, neither breathing in nor out. Here, at neutral buoyancy, where the weight of the water could cancel out her body's desire to fall up, to be wrenched back into the half-light of the Holocene sunset, maybe, just maybe, she could rest. This would be no trick of levitation, no figure without a ground. This would be sympoietic sleep management. The sea knowing how to hold her body like water in water. There was a deep difference, she sensed, between the feeling of being at sea, that feeling of tumult and discombobulation that was keeping her awake, and truly giving in to the ocean. And she knew she wasn't alone in her tiredness. She read in one news article that millions of adults, quote, may be putting themselves at risk for injury and health and behavior problems because they aren't meeting their minimum sleep need. Exhaustion was epidemic, and that was even before the pandemic hit. Quote, people in this army of the waking tired are more likely to sit and seethe in traffic jams, quarrel with other people, or overeat, end quote. She added guilt and shame and stress about not sleeping to the list of things that were keeping her awake. We know that the need to sleep is a biological fact. Human sleep is regulated by two separate but interactive biological and biochemical mechanisms. First, by our circadian rhythm, 
whereby our internal processes and alertness levels are managed by an internal biological clock. The second mechanism is called sleep-wake sleep homeostasis. Here, an internal biochemical system operates as a kind of timer or counter that intuitively drives our desire to sleep and regulates sleep intensity. This two-process model of sleep-wake regulation, first proposed by Swiss sleep scientist Alexander Borbelli in the 1980s, those days of 24-hour party people, can be partly accounted for by individual genetics. But our ability to slumber is also affected by food, drugs, the temperature around us, what we eat, when we eat, naps, stress, exercise, daily schedules, alarm clocks, and other distress signals. So this makes sleeplessness also an embodied cultural phenomenon. As such, it is unevenly distributed both in degree and in kind. Insomnia, or the inability to sleep among the white and wealthy classes, is directly connected to the rise of mercantile economies and the desires they bred for commodities like coffee and sugar. Insomnia, we therefore learn, emerges out of the middle passage and is built literally on the backs of slaves. More recently, this kind of sleeplessness has become sutured to globalized grind cultures aided and abetted by ever waking telecommunications. Sleep, declared Margaret Thatcher as the 20th century hurtled towards the new millennium was for wimps. Wasting time was morally suspect and whether in the name of God or country or capitalism, idleness was increasingly maligned. Everything pays dividends except dreaming, artist Louise Bourgeois once said, perhaps glancing up from her own insomnia doodles. Meanwhile, the underbelly of the saccharine-spiked, caffeinated, new world way of life was also exhausted, but differently. The overwork and the never sleep of black and brown people is the flip side of that sugar high. While enslaved people and forced laborers would be worked to death as machines of a burgeoning capitalism, other bodies, female bodies, trans bodies, disabled bodies, feared what terror awaited them in the night and in the dark or in a home or in a bed that was never safe. In the words of performance artist, researcher, and nap bishop, Tricia Hersey, any discussion of rest as resistance must remain firmly tethered to a probative analysis of capitalism and white supremacist patriarchy. Otherwise, it just makes no sense. So while it may be so that everybody needs to rest, grind culture is unevenly distributed and something for which we all hold different historical accountabilities, different debts that still need to be repaid. So I wonder what will it take for us to rest as an act also of responsibility and justice. So that woman, that woman on the beach, her fatigue was both deeply personal, but also structural. Her heavy eyelids rose to meet the horizon. The barely perceptible fluke of a whale flickered in the corner of her vision. Over there, a container ship sat on the surface like an apartment complex, tottering on a dodgy foundation. But below the waves, gravity was working differently and queer energy circulated. Her toes stretched out against the wet sand. What kinds of refuge might the undersea offer, she wondered. What would happen if she succumbed to the feeling of tetherlessness? Letting go of any solidity she was clinging to and giving herself over to the sea. Part two, the exhausted sea. Although she wanted the sea to hold her, she hadn't noticed how very tired the sea was too. Breathless, heating up, increasingly acerbic, 
sometimes and in some places sluggish, unable to get up to much at all, other times and other places aggressive and agitated, unpredictable. What might it mean to think of the sea as a body, a body of water that also needs to sleep? This is, of course, a ridiculously anthropomorphic question. But even as Western science reminds us that proper sleep is something that generally requires a centralized nervous system, their studies also suggest that proto-sleep, or the need for rest and rejuvenation, is called up by all kinds of internal and external stimuli and might also be embodied by non-vertebrate entities as well. Non-animal even. Think, for example, of a field that lies fallow for a season or two, or the nudity of deciduous trees in winter, or even the calm before the storm. Given all that we have asked it to bear, it would be reasonable to imagine that the sea would also be fatigued. If our own human homeostatic sleep response is affected by things like alarm clocks, we might consider the increasing anthropophony circling in the deep. Low frequency active military sonar emitting sound pressure of 120 decibels over vast distances, a level that would damage our human ability to hear, while mid frequency sonar above 235 decibels sounds to the ocean like a rocket blast off. High intensity sonar and seismic waves snaking along the ocean floor seek oil and gas deposits while background noise from commercial shipping traffic in the ocean doubles every decade. Who or what could get any rest in all of that racket? Or what about we feed what we feed into the mod of the ocean? All of that detritus of our quotidian desires antidepressants, automobile oil, fertilizer, animal fat, flip-flops, car tires, rubber ducks, plastic bags, as evidenced by the great garbage patches, the benthic rubbish dumps, and the outbursts of E. coli and oil slicks and blue-green algae, red tides, etc. The ocean's metabolism is struggling to keep up. Still thought of as the ultimate carbon sink, the sea is becoming too tired to even carry our carbon anymore. We also ask the oceans to remember so many secrets that we would rather forget. Shipwrecks and sailing disasters, sunken bombs and airplanes mysteriously disappeared from the radar, all consigned to the oblivion of the benthos. To these lists, we have to add the scuttling of humans, slaves of the Middle Passage, contemporary asylum seekers, humans, made inhuman by capitalism and white supremacy's decision to leave them to their fate, to refuse and to even prohibit rescue. But all of this made much easier by all of us who turn away in a move to innocence. These burdens do not go away. They remain circulating in the water as what Toni Morrison and Christina Sharp after her have referred to as residence time. They remain in suspense and in perpetuity. Surely it would not be surprising if these hauntings were still also troubling the sleep of the sea. And as if that weren't enough, we make the sea carry all of this with an increasingly compromised respiratory system. We are literally sucking the life out of her under conditions of hypoxemia, that is where oxygen levels in our own blood are depleted, humans experience deep fatigue. So why not also the sea? Even small changes in sea temperatures dramatically affect the behavior, reproductive patterns, and movements of ocean creatures, which has reverberations up and down ocean food webs, affecting oxygen levels in turn. The sea struggles to breathe. While in the last 50 years, overall oxygen levels in the world's oceans have dropped by an average of 2%, in coastal zones, hypoxic conditions have increased far more dramatically. Dead zones in the ocean where oxygen is almost or totally depleted have quadrupled since the 50s. With nowhere else to dump all of these excessive desires, we ask the sea to hold so, so 
much. One response to this deeply fatigued sea, and one we could take seriously, would be to pull back from all of the ways that we overload this beleaguered body, refusing to treat the sea as the great drain to the mythical away, we might finally let it get some rest. But alongside the impracticality of this utopian suggestion of just leaving the sea be, there is also something very lonely about this conclusion. Even if the sea does not want to be kept unbearably awake, this doesn't mean that the ocean desires no company. The sea is nothing, after all, without all of its companion species. It is made and sustained by all kinds of lively bodies and forces. So instead of solitude, perhaps what the ocean needs in order to rest is communal support. She, that woman, she just wanted the sea to hold her. But what if the sea just needed to be held too? This would not be hospice care, for in one way or another, the sea will certainly outlive us all. But this would demand a different understanding of fatigue as something that could be permitted, as something that should elicit a kind of mutual attentiveness and reprieve. Fatigue, not an index of weakness, nor something to be overcome in order to maximize productivity, not as something that needs to be fixed or cured or something to be avoided. What if instead fatigue indexed a state where we were neither pushing too hard nor giving up entirely, but rather asserting that an inalienable part of making different kinds of worlds is being tired? What if the need to rest and helping each other to do so were rethought as a starting point for collective care? Part three, sympoietic sleep management. Darkness signals to our bodies that it is time to rest. Darkness, though, is not a space of nothing. It's a time of intense activity that, ironically, is effective not only because it is largely obscured, but because it is the oblivion we crave. In these ways, in these ways sleep is not a waste of time, but part of a nocturnal liveliness. The night and the moon and the stars all have their own cycles and rhythms too, their own forms of liveliness. What could be more amazing than the lunar pull of coral gametes bursting like a meteor shower into the dark night sea? The woman at the edge of the sea recalled one of the first times that heavy fatigue had hit her. It was a long time ago after the birth of her first child. No amount of snoozing could relieve the crush of postpartum exhaustion. So the naturopath had given her kelp. Quote, can you picture it swaying there? Brownish green blades undulating in its surrounding blues, tangled like a noose of star sent to guard an eroding planet. Can you imagine its underneath texture of floating leather, feather, an iodine downed in a dream, a sea roof of serpents with no teeth, or drowning sheets of music which, at the near final moment, mutate and become the ocean's iron lungs? This is how Afrofuturist writer Harmony Holiday describes kelp in her essay, Kelp and Exile. In a more prosaic vein, Holiday also tells us that, quote, kelp can grow up to two feet per day, but the increase in ocean temperatures, which is happening steadily at about three degrees per year, causes kelp to wilt and disappear. Some of the planet's most significant deforestation events have in fact occurred underwater. Off the east coast of Tasmania, 95% of the giant kelp forests that once dominated those seas have disappeared in the past few decades. In Western Australia, a particularly hot ocean between 2010 and 2013 wiped out 100 kilometers of kelp forest. 
These forests are not only magnificent in for themselves, but they've been vital for the formation of habitat on reefs around temperate Australia. They are places for hundreds of other species of plants and animals to rest. Emma Lee, a Trabalwi woman from Tebrakuna country in Northeastern Tasmania and an indigenous rights and land management expert at the University of Tasmania's Center for Marine Socioecology describes these stories as akin to quote, the arteries and veins in our bodies, our women's bodies, and when those forests are gone, I know I'm going to feel that loss within my own body. In the absence of many kelp forests, urchin barrens emerge. Writing about the disappearing kelp in coastal California, Harmony Holiday describes these barrens as accumulations of grotesque amounts of sea urchins where the kelp would have been. The urchins, quote, eat the dying kelp as if they are proliferating desperately in a rallying, relaying effort to inspire the kelp population to match their speed. It is exhausting just reading that. As Holiday herself later notes, though, we can hardly blame the urchins. The urchins would themselves be checked and eaten by otters if otters hadn't been hunted by humans to near extinction, she writes. The otters too, it seems, are trying to muster up the energy to keep on keeping on. That otter too needs to rest. Having spun its densely furred flesh at the ocean's surface, the sea otter slumbers on its back, embraced by a giant kelp frond, vegetable tentacle tethered to the seafloor to keep the otter from floating away. Night falling, moon rising, this, the otter, the kelp in the sea. This is another lesson in sympoietic cross-species sleep management. In some ways, kelp helps out a fatigued ocean as well. As the planet's best organic source of iodine, kelp helps stave off the damage of radiation. In Holiday's words, kelp is thus a key player in this symbiotic and always fluctuating relationship between hormone help, metabolism, and light waves. Protecting us from bad light, she writes, it can help temper some of the distressed radiance of our machine age. But what supports the kelp? Pollution, warming oceans, poorly treated sewage, the undersea forests are being pummeled by all of these, we heard. Off the coast of Sydney, though, in places like Little Bay and Coogee Beach, Dr. Adriana Vergas and her colleagues at Operation Crayweed have attached biodegradable mesh substrates where this vital species of forest can regenerate. In many places, these seagrasses now flourish again. Multi-species sympoiesis can also be cyborg. In other words, no body of water, not even the ocean, can go it alone. If imagining the sea as a body, however anthropomorphized, can help us understand its fatigue, what might it mean for us to imagine ourselves, our human bodies of water, as more oceanic? What if we understood ourselves as whole ecologies made up of component bodies and supporting systems? What if the borders of our sovereign selves were to be partially dissolved? This is not only an ontological question of what a body is or even of what a body can do. It is a question of collective care. We need each other. We are nothing without each other. Opening to vulnerability and relying on each other, we help, we might help hold each other's fatigue. Part four Hold on, or the wreckage becoming a reef. The sun has set, the beach darkens. This has the almost synesthetic effect of turning up the volume of the spinning logs and the waves. The world is always louder in the dark, the contours of one's own body becoming softer, more permeable. 
To be alive as bodies of water in these times is exhausting. Some of us might feel tetherless with nowhere to hold on to, with nothing to hold us back. We might feel set adrift in these increasingly hypoxic and plastic particulated seas. But what if tetherless was another way to say, get free? When Darwin was writing his theories of evolution, the origin stories of whales were still something of a mystery, although he did muse that a race of bears could have conceivably evolved into cetaceans. While his speculations were initially ridiculed, we now know that Darwin wasn't too far off. As one recent story tells us, the closest known relative to the whale was Indoeus, a fox-sized deer-like land mammal that didn't really like meat and rather spent long periods of time in the water, resting, in order to avoid becoming someone else's dinner. And eventually, with not a lot of other options, Indoeus developed a taste for fish and a more aquatic lifestyle all around. And then Indoeus became Pachycetus, and Pachycetus became Crichocetus, and then became Rhodocetus, which eventually became Doriodon. And the early land-dwelling whales soon learned to swim deeper, their legs grew shorter, their feet grew webbing. All of these bodies of water part of a genealogy in which walking and swimming whales lived side by side. And then the walkers died out and about 40 million years ago, whales were thriving, tetherless and at sea. She digs her toes deeper into the sand. She realizes she is not alone. Her own heartbeat syncopates with the whale bodies turning beneath her, with the rhythm of the waves lapping at other shores. What if tetherless meant stepping up, speaking out, saying no, letting go, lifting up, stepping back? What if tetherless meant refusing the false compass points that directed us to this place on this beach, feeling so much at sea? What if tetherless meant learning new tricks of navigation from those who have long been swimming, diving, floating, submerging, growing different kinds of worlds? Black feminist lesbian poet Alexis Pauline Gums writes of her ancestors, both human and more than human, below the waves, singing and supporting her. Quote, who do you think thought of the ocean, she writes, we who would be whales? How could we prepare for the lives we evolved into, immersed in a substance we could not breathe, and nevertheless called to be graceful, huge in ways that the world could not hold except by these means, unbound by the limits of time? If we are all bodies of water, perhaps we have all, always, in some ways, been potentially at sea. So look around. Who else is here? What have you collected and what collectivities are forming? Who and what else is with you at sea? On learning, how can we learn new forms of holding each other, new ways to support each other, new ways of allowing each other to rest. How can a feeling of tetherlessness be transubstantiated here in the wreckage into new kinds of world building and world resting? How might the wreckage become a reef? And then maybe we will find our feet are floating. Maybe we too will grow fat and thick skin over our five fingers, hand becoming flipper. Maybe we will learn how to hold our breath for hours and days. Maybe like whales as the sea rose around them, we will learn our new worlds by echolocation, a skill utterly dependent on learning to listen differently. Maybe we will begin our dissolution by helping to foster practices of care, not primarily for the sovereign self, but for the hydro commons of wondrous difference that has also brought us to this time and this place on this beach and at sea. The sky is alive. 
The starlight spectral glow has its own kind of respiration, electrons breathing in the ultraviolet radiation of gamma Cassiopeia, but also exhaling hydrogen alpha radiation as energy that is glowing hot red. These celestial bodies are both unfathomably long ago and also now. As she wraps the ghostly nebular aura of stars around her, bathed in its eerie blue light, she understands that this too is a kind of holding. And these stars are held by this deep time sky that splays as shelter over the sleeping otter, held by the kelp, held by the sea, held by the seabed, which also holds the whole world. And here is a list of the images that you saw featured in this show. And if you'll indulge me, I would like to finish by also putting my acknowledgments for, of course, nobody thinks alone. And I do want to, at least in writing, acknowledge all of the many artists and writers and poets and scientists who helped me think these thoughts. The title of the talk comes from Daisy Lafarge's poem, which will be featured in the exhibition catalog. I also um, are cite I'm citing there from the work of people like Trisha Hersey and Harmony Holiday, Adriana Vergess, Emma Lee, Alexis Pauline Gums, Toni Morrison, Christine Sharp, the Pittock Clam Collective, um, Elionette Sumner's Bremner's work on insomnia, the quote by Louise Bourgeois, everything pays dividends except dreaming. Uh, I actually can't find the source, but I've seen that written a few places, still looking. And lots of science about jellyfish sleep and human sleep, ocean pollution, contamination, star breathing, ocean carbon sinks, astronomy, and whale evolution. Um, and just to note that uh, versions of this talk have been previously featured um, at the Lofoten Biennale, and at the Riga Biennale and at a talk for Art Hub Copenhagen last year. But I hope if you heard any of those previous talks that parsed through the work of Eileen Agar and uh, that brilliant line by Daisy Lafarge, some of it resonates also differently. Thank you. Hi, Estrida, thank you. Estrida, thank you so much for this um, incredible talk, um, which, you know, I think many of us will be reflecting on for some time. Um, it took us on a poetic journey from the rack zones of the shoreline through exhaustion and care to evolution, deep time and to the present. Um, I have some questions or more sort of discussion uh, areas that I'd love to reflect on with you. Um, and we also have time for some audience questions. So, so now I'd like to encourage everyone again, if you're watching and would like to um, participate in the discussion, then please post um, any thoughts, comments, questions, anything in the chat. Um, as we'd love to have your contributions as well. Um, so, Astrid, I think first I'd like to talk about uh, going to the start of your talk um, and throughout it, the, the notion of borders and the rack zone uh, as a kind of permeable boundary between the ocean and the land. And it's for people that aren't familiar with that terminology, the rack zone is the area on the beach or the shore where the um, kind of matter and debris of the sea washes up um, and in some ways it is a boundary that potentially like many boundaries and borders is somehow kind of you know imaginary it's useful in creating or thinking about that separation but it kind of we, it also breaks that down um, and it made me also think about later in your talk you speak about what if the borders of our sovereign selves were to be partially dissolved. Um, and the notion of both the boundary between the sea and the land, but between ourselves and the sea. And I think what, what I'd like to ask is if you can talk more about this notion of the rack zone and how you came to work with that as a device in your, in your work and writing. Thank you so much, uh, Jane. Uh, lots, lots to think about there. <laughs> Let me just 
start from one end. Um, so let me first acknowledge that this image of the rack zone came to me by being literally given to me. It was the uh, theme of a conference that was held by the um, Association for Literature and Environment in Canada in 2018. Um, it was the conference was held on Vancouver Island in Canada, and you know the theme of the conference was the rack zone. So in response to that, um, myself and Emily McGiffin, Sue Reed, Jennifer Hamilton, and Kate Sandilands, you know, we we convened a writing retreat right before the conference where we, you know, did this experimental writing practice, trying to think with and through, you know, settler colonialism, environmental pollution in the context of this thing, the rack zone, while also being literally in a rack zone, you know, writing along the beach. Um, so that was where the image came from. And then, you know, starting to think about the ethics of the rack zone, which I also cite at one point in the talk when I'm asking us to look around us and see who else is there with us. That is um, cited from some of the writing we did on that retreat. So it's like this image that was gifted to me, but that I have found to be an exceptionally uh, fecund way of thinking with and furthering my sort of bodies of water project. Um, which relates to your part of the question about dissolving the, you know, the borders of the sovereign self. So, you know, in bodies of water, I was trying to pay very close phenomenological attention to what it means to be a body of water, whether that's, you know, a human or another animal or another kind of biological being or a meteorological being like a weather front or an ocean, a river. And when we sort of pay very close attention to how these bodies function, of course, there is no body that is completely permeable. You know, bodies of water can biologically exist, in fact, only because they're permeable to different degrees, right? And because water is in exchange between them. Um, so at the level of the body, we can think of how the permeable border is in fact necessary for survival and growth and change and trans, you know, transformation. And then in the rack zone, you know, that's another way to think about a border that is also, you know, a zone of, of exchange and a zone of transformation. Um, I noted in reading through some of the work about Eileen Agar in the exhibition catalog, you know, this is also what she was thinking about, right? Wandering along the beach is thinking about how this zone is, is also a zone of transformation. Now, that's not to say all transformation is life-giving. Sometimes transformation is also deadly and it's also you know, can be overwhelming. We can be swept out to sea. So I don't want to overly romanticize this. I just want us to take it seriously. What if we you know, start from the premise that these borders are permeable? How do we work with that instead of against that and trying to shore up this myth that somehow we can put a border that can you know, definitively, definitively keep you know, other bodies in or out? You know, and there we could talk, of course, about migration politics and and viral, you know, um, epidemiologies. We could, you know, think about so many things that, you know, continuously belie the the myth of the impermeable border. Yeah, I think that's. Um, it also kind of brings me to the next question, which was about the symbiotic relationships, um, which obviously is, is part of the nature of the permeable border that is, is kind of in a continuum in some ways and. You talk, you know, symbiotic, but symporeatic as well, you know, which is a term that you borrow from Haraway. And I think the relationship between human bodies and water bodies, how we care for them with the ocean, how it cares for us, this sort of collective care and support structures. Um, and forgive me if this sounds like a bit of a tentative link, but I, I feel like somehow this is also connected to notions of oblivion that you talk about, a kind of like sense of us as humans, the way in which we give ourselves over to the sea um, and the experience of kind of being in the sea, the embodiedness of that experience. I think this, you know, the idea of, of tetherlessness, of floating free, um, this is this idea of care and holding, who holds who, when, at what moment. Um, and and to me, it resonated with, a, with an experience of of swimming in the sea with the notion of the horizon line when you see nothing else beyond your body when you're in a big open expanse of water. Um, and so this might be a very, uh, you know, I've read the paper today, I've heard you heard you 
heard you deliver it now. And, and I'm still thinking through this idea of, of oblivion, actually, which sounds a bit kind of awful, but we are standing on the edge of climate catastrophe. So perhaps that is somehow something we need to delve into, <laughs> yeah. as bleak as it is. Yeah, as bleak or as um, as seductive as it is, right, for some, right, like oblivion, like Freud didn't talk about the oceanic feeling, you know, for nothing. It is also this sense of like oneness and giving oneself over and actually relinquishing the bodily burdens that we, you know, have to bear. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think there is, it's not a tentative link. It's definitely there. And, and in the talk, which, you know, I rewrite every time I give it, you know, I'm always trying to hone it a little bit more specifically. And I think what I'm, I'm also trying to think about is there is the sort of image and the imaginary of being at sea, being tetherless, the oceanic feeling where, you know, we are like water in water and, and you know, the borders completely dissolve. And although that is seductive, we also know that that is, unless it results in death or real oblivion, you know, that actually that state is, is sort of just a kind of a temporary state that we can visit, you know, and I mean that both like materially. So if we actually go for a swim in the water and we experience that, you know, floating, submerging, diving, you know, the sea as a, as a body that is not the same body as us, we're connected, but we're not the same, you know, the sea also resists us being there for too long. We have to come up for air. We have to go back to shore. Our oxygen tank runs out. You know, the thing about bodies of water as connected but different means that we're still always not quite able to be the body in another body of water completely. Those borders are permeable, but they're still real, right? So, um, you know, for any philosophy uh, people in the audience, the idea of, you know, Gilles Deleuze's body without organs, you know, he people find that such a seductive concept of the body disorganizing and dissolving. But, you know, uh, Deleuze and Guattari also say in that text that, you know, you cannot completely dissolve, you know, that equals annihilation. You know, and annihilation is a possibility, but the trick is how do you, how do you cultivate an experience where you can be partially dissolved, where we can partially dissolve our sovereign selves, where we can hold each other and open to the risky business of sympoietic care. It's always a risky business, but not, hopefully, um, slip over into oblivion. And, you know, I mean that sort of poetically, but also really, you know, really, you know, very non-abstractly. Um, uh, you know, suicide rates are higher than ever. We know that, you know, climate change is, is worse than ever. We also know that. So it's not like oblivion isn't on the horizon. It is. So how can we practice care and care for each other and holding, which means having to open ourselves up at a time when maybe we want to close off? How do we instead cultivate practices of collective care? You know, which if we look around us, we see, you know, people are doing. So, you know, stepping that up, even though it might be a risk. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the connection that you make as well to to sleeping, to dreaming, insomnia, um, as something that can or could extend to the natural world. And you talk about proto-sleep, so the deciduous tree or the fallow field. And I, I guess without extending it too far, it also brings us in a way back to surrealism once we enter the world of, of dreams and sleep. But um, what I particularly like is how it breaks down binaries of how we imagine or understand sleeping versus waking, which kind of, by extension through the paper kind of troubles our binaries of night and day or active resting uh, or maybe even dry wet in a way which kind of goes further but um you know and this notion that we have the ability to give rest to as a kind of supportive withdrawal um as a kind of form of care and but anyway the thing that I was interested in was was this kind of notion of proto-sleep which is something that I hadn't come across before uh this idea of extending to the natural world and you know other examples or is, is this an area that you've you've drawn further research into that you can share or um it's yeah thanks thanks Jane that's a, a really nice question um look I suppose it's a little bit kind of my my method as a as a writer and someone who um 
often does this thing where, uh, I mean, you could call it a version of synesthesia or synes something else, um, where I'm interested in, like as a phenomenologist, I'm interested in phenomena. And, you know, when you sort of break down a phenomena like sleep, to like what it essentially is or could be, how does that then actually make connections to other things that we never viewed in that light? So like in this talk, I'm thinking about sleep as something that humans in more than human worlds, you know, share in, in some kind of sense. If that means giving a body a chance to rest, rejuvenate, recuperate in order to be able to keep doing the thing that it does. Um, or in other places, though, I thought about things like you know, sex or queer or um, uh, like breathing, you know, like, you know, thinking about respiration as, as uh, you know, there, that's a much more common thing right now to think about, you know, trees breathe and you know, um, other kinds of non-humans breathe, but, you know, really sort of going with that is what does it mean to breathe? What does it mean to sleep? What does it mean to desire? What does it mean to love, to hold, to care? Like all of these fundamental um phenomena that sort of keep, keep the world in all of its wondrous, you know, sympoesis functioning, you know, how, how does it um, both expand our understanding of that thing that we do, i.e. sleep, but also then open up a pathway for connecting more than human worlds that might potentially then lead to something like uh, an environmental ethic or a sort of social and environmental justice practice. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a question from the chat because um, we've had a question here. How does language affect the construction of this border between humans and ocean, but also between other bodies of water, ocean, sea, river, stream, cloud, creek? Um, so, yeah, this question around around language and construction of these these notions and borders. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I know we're running out of time. I could talk for hours, but I'll talk <laughs> for a minute instead. Um, of course, as a writer, I'm very interested in the question of language. It's my tool. It's the, the thing I use. Um, and uh, of course, I think that, and not only I think, you know, there's plenty of excellent philosophy, but also scientific research on the languages that other non-human beings used to communicate. So bees and their leg rubbing dances or trees that, you know, emit signals to each other, both above ground and below ground. Um, you know, the work of uh, philosophers like Vicki Kirby discusses, you know, the, that, you know, all, all matter has a language, you know, that communicates and we as humans just sort of do language in a specific way. But, you know, all things have languages of their own. So I do think that language itself, like sleep or like desire, is something that you know all material bodies have. But then it's a question of how much of that is translatable and communicable. And you know, like water, I would think that language is something that, through my you know wrangling and wrestling with finding the right turn of phrase, I can somehow reach into and connect with other bodies. You know, maybe more than human bodies. Like poetry is a way to connect with an ocean or a lake. But it doesn't mean that I could ever flawlessly and masterfully understand what the ocean is speaking to me or understand the song of the whale or the, you know, the, the language of the trees. I may be able to access that with deep attention and you know, attentive practice and, and slowing down and learning and all of those things. But will I ever be able to master that? No. And I think that's where, again, we have a permeable border that is about connection, but not assimilation or mastery. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so someone's asked, uh, if there's time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on bodies as archives and what watery fluid embodiment, um, what watery fluid embodied bodily archives may reveal. Mm, thanks so much. Um, I do have a small uh, chapter called uh, uh, water, a queer archive of feeling that's uh, in a book called Tidalectics, edited by Stecky Hessler, if you want to check it out. Um, but briefly, I, yes, I have thought a lot about water as archive. And again, this was one of those things where I was reading, you know, in a very human centered discipline, I was reading the work of Anne Setkovich and her work on depression and queer archives of feeling and looking at, you know, public, public depression and other kinds of archives that 
sort of were not just archives of like official documents, but archives of like what could be called, you know, a structure of feeling. Like what was the feeling that was going on at a time that was also in these archives, archived mm -hmm. by them. And so I started to think about oceans, you know, also as archives. You know, when I think about everything we dump into the ocean, like anthropogenically, of course that is an archive, you know, of, you know, horrific events such as the transatlantic slave trade, but also of just, you know, like consumer desire, you know, anybody who walks along the shoreline anywhere, anywhere around the world will now be, you know, picking up those pieces of plastic debris that are traveling around the world and washing up on shore. So, you know, it's this archive that's also, you know, speaking back to us, sort of asking us to reckon with these things that we had dumped out of sight and out of mind, supposedly, and now are sort of coming back, like the archive is, is leaking or sort of speaking back to us in some way. Um, I think that, you know, that's also like a material and a scientific understanding of the ocean as an archive, but also there's like an imaginative or poetic or artistic way in which I think that we also, you know, through time, many cultures have thought about water and oceans as archives of feeling, as, you know, sites of connection where we can sort of metabolize, digest and, and come to, to know our own emotional states and feelings and affects, relationships, you know, differently. It's sort of like a, a way to sort of process and, and safeguard those things as well. So thanks for the question. Um, that's the subject of a whole other talk. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sreeda. It's been really a pleasure to, to host you um, for your talk this evening. And it's been a really great way um, towards the beginning of the series to, to start our thinking. Um, and yeah, so it, it's just a huge thank you to you. Um, before we go, I just would like to briefly signpost uh, the next event in the programme, which is in two weeks time uh, on the 6th of May, curated by Gareth Evans, our adjunct film curator. And it's a screening and discussion of two new artists' feature length films, um, Joshua Bonetta's The Two Sites and Hugh Wall's The Republic. And both of these films engage in multi-sensory ways with the wetlands of the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. So um, please join us for that event in two weeks. Um, but for now, huge thank you, Astrida Nimanis. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Um, and good night to, to everyone else.